Uh, good morning. Um, as you said, my name is Julie Schnur. I'm a student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, my advisor is Dr. Milton Garces. Um, and this morning I'll be talking to you about a project I began this summer at Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, relating to air blast modeling and using the parameters of air blast in order to estimate the yield of very small yield uh, above ground explosions. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my mentors at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Artie Rogers and Kim Moon Kim. Uh, so first a little bit of background on air blast. Um, when an explosion occurs above Earth's surface, um, a sudden pressure change occurs. Uh, this generates a wave that couples with the atmosphere, uh, which then propagates as air blasts, acoustic, and infrasound waves. Uh, the image to the right is a traditional air blast model. Uh, note the sharp discontinuity at the onset and then the decay uh, following the peak overpressure. So obviously being able to accurately estimate yield is an important part of the post-detonation analysis of explosive events. Um, the analysis of air blast parameters can provide good estimates of yield for above ground explosions. Um, the main focus of my internship this summer at Lawrence Livermore was testing a software developed at Lawrence Livermore uh, that combines seismic and air blast data in order to solve for the most likely yield and height of burst of an explosive event. Um, in addition, uh, we've begun working on developing new, more versatile air blast models uh, for yield estimation as well as other um, applications. Uh, the data for our experiment came from a series of 70 high explosive detonations that took place at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, as I mentioned, the yields were very small. So in this case, one to 15 kilograms, which is tiny. Um, the height of burst depth of burial ranged from uh, minus one buried below the surface to four meters above the surface. And the shape and size of the charge was also varied. Um, this series included repeated explosions, which allowed for investigations into the variability of air blast parameters due to various factors like explosion size and atmospheric conditions. Uh, the map to the right is the source location relative to the station locations. Uh, the location of the explosive source was not varied throughout the experiment. Um, so in order to both compare uh, our data set with existing air blast models, uh, as well as to verify that we had properly applied uh, metadata uh, corrections, uh, we first uh, made measurements directly on the air blast before running through the yield estimation software. Uh, so the data was continuously recorded, so this required extracting the air blast from the continuous data set. Uh, our primary criteria for doing so was just timing, so the estimated time of blast and then the uh, time it would take for a air blast to travel at the standard speed of sound in the atmosphere. Um, the two most important metrics uh, to keep in mind um, measurements we, we, we made on the air blast are the peak overpressure and the positive impulse. Uh, the peak overpressure just being the uh, maximum positive overpressure in the time window, and then the positive impulse uh, being the area under the positive part of the curve. Uh, the reason these metrics are important is because they've been shown to be closely tied to the yield of, a, of an explosion. Uh, these are the results of our direct measurements. Uh, uh, the impulse plot is above and the peak pressure is below. Uh, so the range and impulse are both scaled by the yield of the explosion, which is what allows for yield determination. Um, as you can see, the data agrees with the model at close range and then begins to diverge. Uh, this is due to propagation effects as the wave tra waves travel through the atmosphere and is something we expect to see. Uh, in addition, we measured the travel velocity of the waves. Um, uh, we came up with a pretty tight distribution, which is consistent with the expected speed of sound in the atmosphere, uh, which confirms that our method of detecting the air blasts and extracting them is sufficiently accurate. Um, you can see a few extreme outliers uh, on the histogram. Uh, this is due to metadata issues with certain stations. Uh, incorrect lab longs and such, and this data was not included in the uh, yield estimation part of the analysis. 
Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the uh, data begins to diverge from the models at longer range. Um, in the future, we'd like to develop models uh, which capture the curvature of the data. Um, so this is an example of introducing a nonlinear term to the model on the previous slide in order to capture the curvature of the model. Uh, so in future work, we'd like to look into uh, kind of when and how the model goes nonlinear in log space um, in order to possibly extend the range over which we can accurately invert for yield. So in terms of the yield estimation software, um, it's designed to incorporate seismic and air pressure data. Uh, in our case, with such small yield explosions, uh, we didn't see usable seismic data. Um, so this is just with air blast data. Um, the software has two possible methods, both using positive impulse uh, to determine yield from air blasts. Uh, the first being just a grid search method, and the second being uh, a Markov chain Monte Carlo stochastic inversion. Uh, the main difference to keep in mind with these methods is the grid search method just searches uniformly. Uh, the Markov chain Monte Carlo method uh, does a guided random walk. Uh, in both cases, the user determines the initial step size. In the case of the MCMC method, uh, the step size is then updated. Uh, the user also selects the number of chains. Uh, in our case, we used four. Uh, these begin near the edge of the search base. So we compared the Lawrence Livermore developed software estimated yields to the true yields for 67 detonations. The remaining three out of 70 events um, had the aforementioned metadata issues. Um, so our mean absolute error was less than 30%, which is comparable to the results that uh, we've been getting at higher yields. Uh, so those results are promising in terms of being able to apply the software to very small yields. Uh, we also performed an ANOVA test uh, to look at the for significant, statistically significant differences uh, in the means of the groups uh, for percent error. Um, so we grouped by the true yield of the explosions. Um, and what we found was that uh, the percent difference of the yield groups are not significantly different um, between yield groups. So what this tells us is that um, in terms of significantly, statistically significant differences between groups, um, the accuracy of the method doesn't diminish uh, at the lower yield. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're also working on developing new, more versatile air blast models. Um, this is one such model. Um, it's based on the derivative of the approximate Landau distribution, the Moyal approximation, which is shown in blue. Uh, I want to make clear that I'm not trying to draw an analogy between the traditional use of the Moyal approximation in particle physics and an air blast. It's just a functional form that works. Um, it's advantageous over older air blast models in that it's continuous and differentiable. Uh, it does resemble real air blast data, um, which I'll be showing in future slides. It's also impulse balanced and captures the negative phase. Uh, and by impulse balance, I mean the area under the positive part of the curve uh, cancels out with the area under the negative part of the curve, uh, which also means it meets the admissibility criteria for continuous wavelet transform, um, which opens up some possible detection applications, potentially. Um, so, in the plot, you can see a preliminary fit done to real air blast data from the very small yield data set I mentioned. Um, in this case, it's a 1.88 kilogram shot um, at 2.52 kilometers of range. Uh, just, I just used a simple least squared method to fit a functional form uh, to the small yield air blast data. It's a preliminary fit in that all I did was take the wavelet and scaled it. Um, in future fits, I want to include a shape parameter to be able to capture a wider variety of shapes of air blasts. Um, so to do this, I just set the zero crossing by at the measured zero crossing and then scaled vertically and horizontally. Uh, so in the future, I'll experiment with fitting a more general version of this function to a large air blast data set um, provided by Lawrence Livermore. 
So this plot shows um, a comparison between uh, the new model and various older air loss models, um, the red one being the new one. Uh, again, the main difference between this and older models is that it's continuous and differentiable. Uh, traditional air blast models have been discontinuous to capture that sharp onset. Um, this can prevent problems if uh, you want to use the waveform in finite difference modeling, um, which is something the scientists at Livermore are interested in working on. So in order to compare the waveforms, we followed the procedure of Garces 2017 to scale the wavelet by peak overpressure and positive pulse duration. Um, so to reiterate, um, this wavelet called the, that I've been calling the Landau wavelet will be tested against real air blast data along with older models uh, to verify both that, uh, both goodness of fit as well as the ability of the model to reproduce the canonical parameters that have been shown to be closely tied to yield, particularly um, impulse so area under the positive curve as well as peak over pressure. So to conclude, um, we've tested the Lawrence Livermore yield estimation software on a very small yield data set and concluded that the software is indeed applicable to such a data set. Uh, even in the case when seismic data is not usable, it still produces uh, yield estimations that have been that are consistent with the results of uh, data sets at much higher yield. Uh, we compared the, uh, some of the models used in this software to the uh, direct measurements. Um, and we've begun developing a new more versatile air blast model and scaled it um, according to peak over pressure and pulse duration. Um, next steps, uh, we plan to look more into when and how the impulse and other uh, air blast parameters go nonlinear in log log space. And the new set of forensic surface shots that Milton mentioned are something that will help with that. Um, as we can study uh, how the waves propagate as they move uh, further away from the source. Um, and we'll also be testing the new air blast model against a large air blast data set. And eventually, we'd like to apply this new air blast model in waveform-based yield estimates following the procedure of Kim and Rogers 2016. Thank you. We chose coplanar over something like pixelated because it uses simple readout electronics. And then we chose CZT because it minimizes memory effect. Now, memory effect is when you have the diffusion of xenon into the surrounding material.